All right, so today's lecture is about databases. So specifically, what we'll be covering in today's class is all about managing data from an organizational perspective. We'll talk about the database approach. Uh, we'll be covering big data, as well as data warehouse and data marks, uh, and knowledge management. We're going to save the ERDs for next class. We won't have time to cover them today. Um, but I have a quick video here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, pause the recording. So give me just a second to do that. Uh, basically, the video just kind of goes over, um, you know, the idea that you have a small thimble. And uh, basically what they're saying is you can fit every piece of knowledge you have in that thimble. Okay? It's a lot funnier if you were to watch the video. But since we don't have audio, uh, just take my word for it. Um, so, the idea with managing data is that we want to do this in a central uh, fashion. Okay, we don't just want to go out and have each functional unit collect data and manage their data independently. Uh, so generally speaking, we want to have one central data uh, base for our company. And that's going to allow us to remove a lot of informational silos and just have lots of uh, good practice in place. So we do that through data governance. So data governance is going to be how we establish rules and procedures relating to what information we collect, how we use it, who can access it, how it's maintained, anything relating to that. It all goes back to data governance. Uh, by the way, I do see a lot of you taking notes. That's good. Um, certainly, encourage and, uh, certainly encourage you to take notes. So data governance is how and why, and also anything relating to what. So that's all about data governance. It's the policies. A lot of times we have a data governance team where it's not just someone from the database department of IT or however the organization is laid out. It has people throughout the organization on it. And that's important because people throughout the organization are going to be using the data. So it follows that they should have a say in what information is collected and how it's used. Okay, so a big part of this is going to be master data. So with master data, what we're doing is we're taking all that organizational information that we have and we're putting it in a central data warehouse. Okay, So that's going to include things relating to our employees, our customers, um, our products, our services. Okay, Anything like that that's going to be central to the operations is shared throughout the organization. Okay, Transaction data is something else we want to discuss. Okay, So a transaction in general, it's going to be a purchase or sale. That's a simplified definition, but it'll suffice. So very important that we have transactional data because that's going to allow us to gain a lot of insight that we otherwise would not be able to. So for instance, if I ask you, what are your company's sales for quarter one of 2019? Okay, Can you really get that value if you don't collect transactions? No. So let's say that we're a cash-only business. All right? Let's use a laundry map. Let's say we're coin-operated. So if we don't maintain sales records, do we really know? Okay. So we keep transactions, then we know precisely what we purchased and we know what we sold. All right. So that's pretty basic. So a big component of this, and this is basically the second half of this class. So the first half is all about Excel. We're now in Unit 2. Unit 2 is all about databases. Um, so Unit 3, of course, will be the project. But just think about a database as something that is easily able to be modified, easily able to be searched, and it's going to provide us a lot of information very rapidly. So what records can we store? Nearly anything. Okay, 
we talked about some of the components of master data. Okay, who can tell me what some of those are? Yeah. Exactly. So any organizational data, employees, we can certainly store that. Um, transactions, we can store that. Um, you know, customers, we can store that. Shipping locations, we can store that. Pretty much anything. All right. And the advantages of database, though, are that we're reducing data redundancy. So when we say data redundancy, what that means is stuff is stored multiple times. So let's say that we had transactions. And let's say we're doing everything in an Excel spreadsheet. So you guys remember the wine database that we had for the wine transactions? We had people who had 48 orders inside of that database. So their customer data was stored 48 times. Is everyone with me so far? So that means we're storing stuff 48 times more than we need to. Uh, that's a bad thing because in most cases with a database, we're probably not going to be locally hosting it. Okay. It's possible we are, but it's just less likely that we are. So that means we're paying for cloud storage. Okay, cloud storage, we pay for every gigabyte that we use. So if we're using 48 times more than we need to, that means we're paying more than we need to. Probably not 48 times more, because there will be some uh, scale there, but certainly more. Not to mention, with databases, you want to make sure that you're having um, multiple copies of it. Okay, you don't just want to have a single copy that you're actively using, developing, testing on, everything. That would be very bad. Okay, So you want to minimize redundancy. You want to minimize data isolation. Okay, so data isolation we've talked about already, but isolation just meaning that it's only accessible to part of the organization. Okay. In general, we want to have our databases accessible to the entirety of the organization. It's not to say that's going to be true in 100% of circumstances. All right, because there are obviously will be some confidential databases. Okay, but on the whole, we're talking about the data that's available. We want it to all be available. Okay, and then lastly, data inconsistency. So data inconsistency is going to be when we have records that are the same but do not appear the same. So for instance, let's say that we had three addresses. Okay, 123 Sesame Street. Okay, 123 Sesame Street. And let's say 123 Sesame. All right. These are the same address, right? But if we have inconsistency and you're trying to find 123 Sesame Street, and let's say you type in this, you're not going to get this and this. Does everyone understand me so far? Okay, so we have ways around this with databases. All right. The obvious way is to use something like what the USPS provides. Okay, so they provide a database of all addresses in the United States. And what happens is whenever you enter an address, it's going to check it and make sure that you're entering an address that is going to be standard. All right. Some of the stuff we can do to minimize data inconsistency. All right, we want to maximize data security. So who wants to debate whether or not uh, data stored on paper is more secure than data in a database. Anyone want to debate me? I'm always happy to debate. Okay. So, data stored in a database, not necessarily more or less secure than data stored on paper. All right. It all depends upon how you're managing your database. If you're never running any updates on the database and using very weak passwords and you have weak network security and weak everything, yeah, you're, it's not very secure. Okay? But if you're doing everything correctly, you can certainly put appropriate controls in place to have the data be more secure than paper. Okay, so let's face it. Paper's only secure as the lock that it's on. All right? And most locks aren't very good. Okay? Uh, let's face it. There are very few doors you can't kick in. 
all right? Very few doors, you couldn't shoot, okay? So data security is going to be improved with databases. Ceteris paribus, not in every case, but assuming you're doing both of them properly, you're going to have higher database security with the database than you would with paper records. Um, data integrity, you want to make sure you're storing the correct records. Uh, there's going to be some room for human error anytime you're doing manual entry. So how do we reduce that with a database? Well, we use data validation. Okay. So the idea behind data validation is that whenever we're entering something, we're checking to make sure it's correct. Think about whenever you're typing a paper, okay, and you misspell a word. It's going to tell you this word's probably misspelled. That's data validation. We can do similar things on a database. Data independence, uh, this is a very important thing as well. So data independence is meaning that the data is not tied into a specific product or vendor. Uh, so the idea behind something like a structured query language database is that it's going to be portable. Okay. Your data is separate from the product. And that's a very important thing because that eliminates a lot of vendor lock-in. I personally abhor vendor lock-in. Right, I'm not saying you should too, but basically what happens with a lot of enterprise contracts is over time, okay, they're going to continually raise costs. All right, and if you're locked in, you have to keep paying this. Okay, imagine if you're not locked in. Imagine if your data is completely separate from the applications that you're using. Okay, then when they start to do this, what can you do? Okay, draw a little stick figure here, and you run away. Does everyone understand that? That's what data independence buys you. Okay, so that's very beneficial. Now, there's a lot of ERP applications out there. The idea is that you have a database that is separate from the application. Okay. There's a lot of other applications out there. Name your favorite industry. Someone tell me their favorite industry. Anyone's favorite industry. Okay, music. So, let's say we're a record producer. All right, we're bringing in a lot of money. Okay, well, the good news is, is that with music, okay, we're going to have, let's say we'd have our own database to talk about what records we're producing, cost, all that sort of stuff. That's not tied into any specific product, okay? So that's going to allow us to then be able to, like the stick figure here, run away if the costs start to go increase. Does everyone understand data independence? So just think about it as your data is not tied into a specific product. Okay. And also, if you have a database, multiple applications can interface with it. So let's say you're using, I don't know, uh, Oracle's ERP. Okay. And you're using some other transaction processing system for some reason. They can interface with the same database. That's a huge advantage. All right. So talk about big data a little bit. Okay, the idea behind big data is it's data that is large. What do I mean by large? Okay, I mean it takes up a lot of space. Okay, so we're not talking about a couple megabytes. A lot of times we're talking about multiple terabytes of data. And another key definition here, unstructured. Okay, so everything we've done up to this point in Excel, it's been highly structured, right? Okay, so we have very distinct rows and we have very distinct columns. All right, big data is unstructured. So you don't have those very distinct columns. All right, so three V's of big data, okay, volume. That's how much space it takes up, okay? The velocity, that's how rapidly is the data growing. All right, and then finally you have variety. Variety is looking at how unstructured the data actually is. Okay, because not all big data is going to be the same. So, for instance, let's say that you're a company and you're wanting to do social media analysis. Let's see what people think about your products and services. Okay, so whenever you gather all that data, it's going to have a certain size. And let's say it's a new hot product. Okay, someone name me a new hot product. 
any product. Poppets, I'm not familiar with that personally, but uh, you know the idea is that if a lot of people are talking about poppets, okay, lots of new uh, Twitter posts or whatever platform you choose to use, that's going to have a high velocity, okay, because it's rapid additions of new data. All right, someone name me a product that you don't care about and no one cares about it. Well, let's use a different one. Fax machine. All right. Let's say that in 2022, I have a company. Well, let's not use me. Why on earth would I be releasing a fax machine? Um, let's say that someone you don't like has a company that releases a new fax machine. All right. There may be a lot of people making fun of it. Okay, that's possible. But let's just assume that everyone ignores it. Quibi. Okay. Is anyone in here a big fan of Quibi when it was a thing? The velocity might be high because people might want to make jokes about it, okay? And I'm not saying that I made jokes about it, but some people probably did. But if you have something that no one talks about, it's going to have very low velocity. All right, and then finally, variety, how varied the actual data is, okay? So in other words, how unstructured is it? Okay, with Twitter posts, it's going to be fairly structured, right? You're going to have the header, you're going to have the actual message, possibly a link at the end, possibly hashtags. That's highly structured. So it's not necessarily completely unstructured. It's not laid out in a grid, but you can easily put it into a table if you so desired. Okay? It's not very difficult to do. So those are the three Vs. Any questions? All right, so some examples of big data. Probably not the best example, traditional enterprise data. Okay, because traditional enterprise data, stuff like transactions, stuff like master data that we've talked about, okay, that's pretty structured, right? Fits really nicely into a database. I have it up here, though, because it's also very large in most cases. Um, so someone name your favorite company. Any company, what's your favorite one? Okay, Tesla. So Tesla is going to have a database, probably a lot of databases, but the idea is they're going to have a table for stuff like who's using superchargers. Okay, and if you think about that, you have all those transactions. Are they going to have a pretty substantial number of transactions? Easily in the millions each day, right? Okay. Now, if they had just car sales probably not going to be in the millions for a day. Uh, that's pretty obvious. There's, what, 350 million people in the United States. On any given day, I highly doubt that 0.3% of them are buying a Tesla. Okay, I don't think that would be logical at all. Uh, because basically what that's saying is that in a year, the whole country has a Tesla. That's ridiculous. All right, so think about the size. So what else does Tesla have? They have car sales. They have a supercharging network. What about vehicle maintenance and upkeep? So they're going to have some stuff there as well. Um, they're going to have information about their employees. When you put it all together, it probably does get close to being large. All right, something that's definitely going to be large, machine-generated or sensor data. So imagine we have a factory. And the factory has an assembly line, okay? And the assembly line has, I don't know, what's your favorite product? Someone throw me your favorite product. Literally any product. Toothpaste, all right? So something I've always wondered about toothpaste, okay? They can pump water to my house. Why can't the toothpaste factory do the same? That's a silly little thing, I know. Anyway, so you have toothpaste. Along the production line for toothpaste, you're going to have various sensors. Okay, they're going to sense what uh, 
what the composition is of the toothpaste and that sort of thing. You know, weight, um, maybe the color, maybe the ingredients. You know, they're going to have lots of stuff like that. Maybe even temperature. So the idea is that it's not necessarily constantly providing that information, but it can provide that information multiple times a second. Sometimes multiple times a minute, but a lot of times you'll have it hundreds of times a second. Okay, think about an airplane. Okay, when you fly on an airplane, think about all the different sensors within the airplane. Okay, so just in an engine alone, there's going to be multiple sensors. Those sensors are providing data multiple times a second. All right, so that's going to be automatically generated. Now, when we think about the variety of that data, is the variety going to be high or low? You're pretty low, okay, because a sensor is basically just giving you the status of it over and over and over. All right, that doesn't really necessarily change much. Okay, it's going to be the same structure. It's going to tell you basically the sensor name and the status. Two things over and over. Social data, we've talked about that. Talked about you know looking at Twitter posts, that sort of thing, uh, Facebook. You know the idea is that anything you can pull down is probably beneficial to. Okay, because if you think about it, you know. That's direct feedback. It's also freely given. All right, that contrasts with a lot of other ways to get direct feedback. Okay, so the main other way to solicit direct feedback would be to ask people. All right, that costs money. So let's say that we are Target and we care what our customers think. Okay, not to tell a bad joke here, but you could probably tell I didn't use Walmart as an example there. So let's say that we're Target. And we want to figure out what do our customers think about our store. So we get the idea. Let's ask everyone when they check out. All right, what's the problem of doing that? It's time consuming. So you're basically spending time to ask people. Now, if I'm asked what is my opinion on something and I'm at a checkout line, am I going to be in the mood to answer that? I'd be a little bit frustrated. All right, if you ask my opinion during office hours on something, I can talk for hours. Okay, but if I'm at a store, I want to be in and out as quickly as possible. All right, so I'm not going to want to sit there and answer a five question survey. So if you ask me that, I'm going to decline. I'm going to get a little bit upset. Not crazy upset, but a little bit. Okay. So social media, on the other hand, it's already been given out. It's freely out there. So why not download what you can, perform sentiment analysis on it? Solicit your direct feedback that way. All right, images. Pretty straightforward. Imagine you had a database collected of images. Uh, maybe even CCTV camera footage if you wanted to. Okay, the idea is you can perform basic analysis on it, see when customers are in or out of a store, uh, depending on the resolution and many other factors, of course. You can determine how long people look at a certain thing, or at least how long people are in a certain area. All right, why is that beneficial? Why would a company want to know that? Exactly, okay. So they want to uh, pull down their footage, do some basic analysis, and get an idea about what people like, what people don't like. So that could be foolproof? Of course not. But it's certainly very beneficial. All right. So some different issues you may run into with big data. Okay, so the first one is we don't necessarily know where it comes from. Or if we do know where it comes from, we don't necessarily trust the source. All right, so if we're getting social media posts, can anyone post on social media? Can our competitors post on social media? Okay, can, let's just be blunt. Can foreign adversaries post on social media? Yeah. So you don't necessarily trust it. Could also be dirty. So when we're talking about dirty, we're talking about the structure of the data. So if it's highly unstructured, it may be difficult, but not impossible. But it may be more difficult to gain any sort of insight from it. Or to even get it to the level to do basic descriptive analytics on it. It may be very difficult. And then also rapid change. Okay, so if data is rapidly changing, what does that mean regarding 
how you can actually perform analysis on it. Okay, so basically you're going to have to, well in a lot of cases what you may have to do, I'm not going to say in every case, you have to download a snapshot of it. And you perform analysis on that snapshot. And then maybe an hour later you do the same thing. Now the idea is that you'd have that scripted and you wouldn't be manually doing that every hour. But still, that's something to account for. Alright, so if you're having data that changes very rapidly, that's a challenge. It's not an impossible hurdle. It's like, you know, you're doing uh, any track runners in here? So it's like, let's say we're uh, going down a track, and we have a little hurdle. Let's say it's 15 inches high. Okay, you can probably jump 15 inches, right? Okay, you have to jump. You can't just run in a straight line and expect to be able to cross it. Okay, what happens if you just run all the way through it? Okay, you trip. All right. You have to cross the hurdle, but it's not insanely high. All right. So different things we may use big data for. Of course, first we have experimentation. So a couple examples of this. Well, number one would be like A-B testing of new website design, that sort of thing. Uh, it's quite common with companies like Amazon and others to roll out slight changes to their website and see how it affects each group. So let's say you have group A and group B, and let's just say that you look at the sales difference. Because okay, if you have millions of customers on each, you can have a pretty good idea of how it affects sales. So let's just say, for instance, that I thought it was a good idea to roll out an e-commerce site where you don't have a buy button. Okay, Would that be a good idea in your opinion? Why not? Yeah, it'd be difficult to sell if you don't have a way to buy. All right, let's say you roll out a different version that does have the buy button. Can you compare those differences? Now, obviously, that's a ridiculous example, but it, it illustrates the point nonetheless. All right. Um, any change, basically, you're just looking to see how it affects things. That's the basics of experimentation. All right, micro-segmentation of customers. Who's a marketing major in here? What's a uh, micro-segmentation? Okay, so in general, segmentation is what? Yeah, so you have general categories. All right, so if you want to categorize your customers, you may say 18 to 29 year old. And that's probably most people in here. All right, it might be a few people who are outside of that, but I'd assume that's probably most people. All right, do most people in here buy the same stuff? All right, probably not. All right, let me call on some people. Kaylin, what's your favorite hobby? Boxing, okay. Lisa, what's your favorite hobby? Golf, all right. Andres, what's your favorite hobby? Soccer. Um, Colton, what's your favorite hobby? Basketball. No one has the same hobby. Do you buy basketballs? All right. Do you buy boxing gloves? Do you buy golf stuff, clubs? All right. But, you know, I would assume Colton's not out there buying $1,000 clubs. You know, probably. You know, are there nicer basketballs than just a standard? Okay. You might be buying those. Okay. That's the problem with segmentation. And when you try to target everyone in a very broad sense, you fail. All right, so micro-segmentation is whenever you target the individual customer. So that gets into a big conversation about data brokers. We have an interesting article about data brokers that we're going to be discussing in one of the weeks, I think it's discussion four, if I'm not mistaken. But the idea is that you gather data, or you don't gather it, you purchase data about the individual customer. And that allows you to directly target them. So now that I know 
that Lisa likes golf, okay, I'm not going to try to sell her a tennis ball. All right? I wouldn't try to sell you anything, but if I were to try to sell Lisa something, I would sell her a golf ball and not a tennis ball. Does that make sense? So we're going to talk a lot more about micro-segmentation, but just understand that modern marketing is not what it was 10 or 20 years ago. Okay, 10 or 20 years ago, let's just be blunt. Okay, used to be sex sells. Okay, you notice they don't do commercials like that anymore. Why not? Could be some moral outrage, whatever. All right, but probably a bigger reason is it just doesn't work. All right. So if you're wanting to sell products and services, you have to find ways to effectively do so. All right. Micro segmentation is an effective approach. All right. So let's say that you're on social media. All right. You on social media, Lisa? Okay. Uh, what about Kaylin? You on social media? Did I pronounce it right, Kaylin? Okay. All right. So do you post a lot about uh, boxing? Okay. Um, do you post a lot about golf or basketball? All right. So if I am a company, I can approach Facebook, I can approach Twitter, and I can say, give me customers who are interested in basketball. And I might get your name. All right. I might send you flyers in the mail. I might uh, promote ads on your specific page. All right. And you may be more inclined to react to something that's something you're interested in than something you're not. Does that make sense? That's only one way to do micro segmentation. Like I said, we're going to talk a lot more about that concept. Personally, I think it's a fascinating topic, but it also has some obvious downsides for stuff like privacy. All right, so creating new business models. All right, business models is what's going to drive your revenue. Okay, so you have all the different predictors of revenue, and those predictors can be data points. All right, product development. Okay, determining what people want. If I want to make a new product, am I going to go out and ask 200 people what they want? No, okay? Because it's not 1980, all right? 2022, we're going to use data points. We're going to see what people can afford. We're going to see what people are affording. All right, so if we're making a car, let's say we're going differentiation route, all right? So differentiation, meaning we're interested in probably a very high-end customer, all right? So you're not going to have a focus group of college students to answer what high-end customers want, all right? Why not? All right, so for the most part, I would assume most of you don't drive luxury cars, all right? Probably a fair assumption. Maybe I'm wrong, all right? I doubt it, though, all right? So product development. Use big data. All right, data warehouse. Like I said, it's going to have all the data for the organization, and it's going to be accessible to the entirety of the organization. That contrasts with a data mart. Okay, data mart has the same information, or at least similar information. But the distinction is, is that it's not available to the entire organization, and it's instead limited to a single functional unit. All right, so a functional unit is another name for what? Department, exactly right. Okay, so think about you have a department database. That's a data mart. You have something across the organization. That's a data warehouse. All right, so some characteristics of data warehouses. Okay. They're always going to be organized by subject. So if you have, let's say, a table for transactions, it's going to have what? It's going to have your transactions. If you have a table for employee, what's it going to have? Employees, exactly. All right. Um, it's going to be integrated into your various applications you're using. So specifically things like a transaction processing system, enterprise resource planning system, any of those major uh, organization-wide systems is going to be integrated with your data warehouse. It's not part of it, okay? It's integrated with it. All right. And that's hugely advantageous for companies because they're not limited to saying, we have access to this data, and it's limited to this system. Okay. 
Think about this as if you get nothing else from this class, think about data independence as a guy running away from rising costs. All right? Because if you ever own a business or if you're ever working at a business and you have the opportunity to do some selection, okay, always select something you can run away from. All right, that's going to be very beneficial. Okay, time variant. All that means is that we have time variables where it makes sense. So, for instance, a transaction, we're going to have time and date of the transaction. Non-volatile, that's very important. If it's accessible to the entire organization, we don't want the entire organization to be able to edit it. Okay, so non-volatile means that it's only editable in the original source. So, let's say we have a transaction processing system. Within that system, we can edit the transactions. Outside the system, we cannot. We can access them, but we cannot edit them. All right, then multidimensional. Basically, this means that we have different tables that are all related to each other. I skipped the video. Um, let's see. We've got four minutes. So intellectual capital is basically going to be our firm's intellectual property or intellectual assets. So think about R&D. Okay. We have new technology, maybe copyrights, maybe patents, maybe trademarks, that sort of thing. That's all intellectual capital. doesn't have to be something that's formally uh, identified either. All right, so anything the organization has learned is knowledge capital. All right, and we have both explicit and tacit knowledge. All right, so explicit knowledge is going to be knowledge that can easily be formally recorded. Okay, uh, it's basically going to be like a hard fact. All right, so let's say that our sales for the any amount of sales, that's explicit knowledge, right? Any transaction, that's explicit knowledge. Anything we can stick inside of a database, pretty much going to be explicit knowledge. Okay, that contrasts with tacit knowledge. So in tacit knowledge, it's going to be knowledge that is gained through experience. It's going to be a lot more opinion-based. Um, a lot of times it's going to be like uh, a gut feeling. So let's say that someone is a mortgage broker, all right, or loan officer, whatever the term is. All right, when someone walks in, okay, they've been doing the job for 5, 10, 15 years. Someone walks in they probably have a really good gut feeling about whether or not that person is going to be approved. Just walking in. All right? That's tacit knowledge. All right? And that gut feeling is not necessarily wrong. Because right? there's a lot of um, nonverbal cues, a lot of other things that the, you know, the body is able to pick up on. All right? And lastly, we have knowledge management system. So the knowledge management system is just going to be a database that's going to be easily searchable to have a lot of organizational knowledge. So this is commonly in stuff like IT, where you have various IT systems uh, inside of an organization. And the idea is that you're going to have a lot of frequently asked questions about said systems. So what you do is you collect all that information, and you store it inside of a knowledge management system. It's not only IT, though. Many other things as well. Um, so this is about all we have time for today. We're going to pick up next class talking about the knowledge lifecycle and going into ERDs. So again, I'll be sticking around if you have any questions about your exam, anything like that. Um, I will also be hosting office hours from 11.10 to 12.20 and 050. So with that, hope you all have a great day. See you all uh, Wednesday.